This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to your word, we recognize that your word is your word. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is in them. You are the author of the plan of salvation. But before there was a need for the plan of salvation, you were the creator of the human race. You created us male and female in your image. And you had a plan and you had a purpose for the human race prior to sin and the entrance of sin and evil into human experience. And Father, that the corruption that has entered into human history from sin and evil will not be erased until our Lord returns and establishes the kingdom. But nevertheless, we still have a mission, and there's much that we can learn from why we were, how we were created and why we were created for that purpose, and those purposes still stand. But, Father, it runs counter to so much of our experience. It runs counter to the ideas and opinions and beliefs that are so often promulgated by our culture, by the media, and by our peers. And it puts us in complete conflict with our culture. And, Father, we need to understand the truth of your word. We need to submit to it and recognize that this is not just a matter of human opinion, but this is your word to us as our creator, the one who designed us, the architect of our lives and our souls and the architect of human history, that we might know how to live in such a way as to truly fulfill your plan and purpose for our lives. And so today as we begin this study on marriage and the family, we pray that you would challenge us, that we might be willing to submit ourselves to your word, to rethink, reevaluate often cherished ideas and views that we might have are just opinions that have leaked into our soul from the world around us that we need to flush out of our thinking. And we pray that you would guide and direct us in this study, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and this morning we're going to begin the next section in Colossians, beginning in verse 18. <clears throat> beginning in verse 18. Now this morning, as we get into this study, we're going to begin a, another sub-series within our series in Colossians. And this one de deals with what the Bible teaches about marriage and the family. This is a crucial and vital study one that every one of us needs to pay attention to, no matter what your current uh, marital status might be. Perhaps you are young and you have not married yet. Well, this is a great time for you to learn about what the Bible teaches about, about marriage and about the uh, roles and responsibilities of men and women in marriage. Perhaps you are married and things are going great, but there are many things that you need to learn. Perhaps you're married and there are a few speed bumps along the way and this is a way to think and reflect at perhaps areas where uh, you need to go back and rethink some things. Perhaps you are beyond marriage, either because of divorce or because of death, and you might think, well, that has sort of passed me by. 
and these issues are not as relevant to me. But let me suggest that perhaps you have children or grandchildren, or if not locally, then within the body of the local church, then one of the principles that Scripture lays is that lays down is that older women are to help younger women in working their way through the basic problems that enter into uh, domestic uh, situations. This is the focus of, of, of Titus chapter 2, that the older women are to teach the younger women. And it doesn't say older women teach younger women doctrine. It says older women teach younger women how to be, uh, how to be good wives, how to be good mothers, how to take care of uh, things uh, around the house, how to handle the problems and difficulties that come into one's life uh, when you're young and you're married and you face different challenges that you haven't faced before. Same thing with older men. Older men are to be there as wise counselors for younger men to help guide, direct them as they uh, grow up and mature and learn to face all of the challenges and issues in life. So no matter what stage of life that you're in, there are things we're going to cover that are pertinent to every, every one of us. And I think that there is one area that is uh, significant for all of us simply because we are living in the 21st century in, in the decline, I believe, of Western civilization in a time in the history of this nation when the very concept of marriage is under attack uh, from numerous forces, from forces within the visible church uh, as an institutional church as well as forces outside of the church. Uh, marriage is in a state of crisis and has been for uh, at least 40 or 50 years as an institution, as a, an institution viewed by society and understood by society. And yet we have all learned and studied over the years that marriage is not something that was developed or invented or by mankind. It wasn't something that was uh, that evolved uh, socially for various pragmatic purposes, but that God instituted and established marriage. God defines it, God uh, ordained it, and God has given us principles and direction in Scripture on how to have a successful marriage. But therein we raise a question, what does it mean to have a successful marriage? To have a successful marriage does not mean that you have a happy marriage. does not mean that you have a marriage that is filled with passion or romance, which is often portrayed in various uh, romantic uh, media, whether it's books or film or whatever. But the, the, the purpose of... The success of a marriage defined biblically is that it fulfills the purpose of God for marriage. And so one of the first things we will address and what we will begin to address this morning is to try to understand the divine purpose for marriage. We talk about marriage because it's something that enters into everybody's experience. People have all kinds of different opinions about marriage. And I'm not talking about just within the church or Christianity, but if you look around the world, there are many different expressions, ideas, and views on marriage. And if you just look in the United States, uh, we see that there are a lot of different views and ideas of marriage. You talk to some people, and they think that marriage is the key to happiness in life. Talk to other people, and they think that marriage is the key to misery in life. You talk to some people and they think that marriage is just some outdated uh, primordial concept that really has no more relevance today. This is usually from the feminist camp that thinks that marriage is really just an outdated form of patriarchal enslavement of women. Uh, many within this camp, many within the uh, world today think that marriage is just something that was culturally determined. It evolved over time. And yet, in contrast to that, as Christians, we believe that 
marriage was not something that just evolved pragmatically. We don't even think that marriage was something God initiated as a response to sin. But that marriage was created and established with a purpose, with goals and objectives, uh, with defined roles before sin ever entered into uh, the human race. And therefore, it is important for us to understand the divine intent of marriage before we can ever get into talking about many of the difficulties, problems, challenges that we face at an experiential level. We first must understand um, what the issues are in God's original intent uh, for, uh, for marriage. Since the collapse of biblical authority in Western civilization, which occurred during the period of the Enlightenment, biblically-based ideas and institutions have been under a consistent assault from the educated and humanist elite, started back in the 17th century, attacking the very idea of biblical authority as an authority. Now, that's important. You may think, well, why in the world are we going back to the Enlightenment when we're talking about marriage? Because it, it, one thing that came out of the Enlightenment was this challenge to the idea of authority. And as we look at the passage before us in Colossians 3, one idea that is deeply embedded in this whole passage is the concept of authority. And in the United States of America in the early 21st century and ever since the end of the Second World War, we have had a, an awful track record when it comes to understanding authority. In fact, there has been a rebellion against authority in Western civilization and in the United States for the last 50 or 60 years. And that is, one, that is a major issue that is at the core of the collapse of marriage and the family. We, it goes back to basic fundamental concepts. So let me, before I go any further in the introduction, let me just go through these verses for us so that you have an overview of where we're going in the remainder of this, of this chapter. In the last couple of weeks, or actually the last couple of months, I've been looking at Colossians 3.16 and then last week at Colossians 3.17. That's really the background to understand the context of what Paul says in verses 18 down through uh, chapter 4, verse 1. That should all be considered one, one context. He begins with this command to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And as we study, this means that the word of Christ is to take up its its dwelling inside of it is to become so much a part of us so much at home in us that it is going to as paul puts it in uh romans 12:2 it's going to completely renovate or overhaul or transform our thinking and and as a result of that transformed thinking it's going to change how we uh, think about everything in life and how we interact with all of the different issues in life it's going to have certain results in our life. The first result that I focused on was in singing and in worship, that it produces a result of teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, uh, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, by singing with uh, grace or gratitude in our hearts to the Lord. And then Paul gives the universal principle here that whatever we do, every area of life, there's no area of life that is outside the authority of God, because that's ultimately what he's saying here is that the word of Christ as the authority in our life is going to tell us where, where our ideas are right and where our ideas are wrong, and it's going to teach us how we are to change and conform to the truth. That's the purpose of God's Word, is to uh, rebuke us, to reprove us, to correct us, and then to put us on the path of righteousness so that we can become all that God intended for us to be as human beings. So the principle is laid down as a reminder here in verse 17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
giving thanks to God, to God the Father through him. And then he's going to go into some other results. Now, in Ephesians 5, verses 19 and following, we have a much more detailed passage that is parallel to this. In this passage, those the commands related to the family are abbreviated. So we'll spend a lot more time looking at the Ephesians passage. But the passage begins in verse 18, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And then beginning in verse 22, it shifts But it's also talking about what happens within the home because the context here is talking about masters and slaves. And when they owned slaves, these slaves were very much a part of the household. So it's still talking about household relationships. And notice in verse 23, I'm not going to read through all of these right now, but in verse 23, Paul again reiterates the underlying principle here. Whatever you do, do it hard heartily to the Lord and not to men. Now, in that verse, in that context, he's applying that to the context of, of the, uh, the slave working for the master. But it reiterates that principle stated back in verse, verse 17, that whatever we do in word or, or in deed, we're to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, when we look at the parallel passage in Ephesians, Ephesians ch- chapter 5, I start this in verse 21. And in the English, it's translated by a participle, reflecting the fact that it's a participle in the Greek. And it's a continuing participle of results. The previous verses, verses 19 and 20, talk about the same uh, ideas that we saw in Colossians 3, 16 and 17. uh, Singing uh, with gratitude in our hearts to the Lord, doing all things uh, out of gratitude for the Lord, being thankful in all things. The difference is that the primary command in Ephesians 5 is found in Ephesians 5.18. And rather than saying, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, it says, be filled by means of the Spirit. It brings in the idea that it is God, the Holy Spirit, that is foundational to the implementation of these commands. It's not something we just do on our own. Uh, The Holy Spirit doesn't make it happen for us. But he fills us, and he fills us with something. And the something that he fills us with, we see in the parallel of Colossians 3.16, is his word. So it's the Spirit of God plus the Word of God that is foundational to renovating, overhauling our thinking. And if we're not willing to submit to the authority of God and his instruction, then it doesn't really matter what else we do in life as Christians because it will ultimately be doomed... To, to failure, to collapse. As we studied in Romans chapter 6, we will be living like dead men, and all it will produce is a death-like existence of misery, self-induced misery, and corruption. We do not lose salvation, but we will never experience the fullness and the happiness and the joy and, that God has has for us. In Ephesians, though, if he, Paul introduces a concept that is fundamental at the very beginning of this section. He identifies a result of the filling of the Spirit as submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, that's an important command, an important result and statement, because it precedes what he says about the family. So it's family and home and, and um and workplace. There is this overall attitude for the believer of submission. Now, what he means by that is not, even though this word is often used in a chain of com- military chain of command type of, of environment, what is important in submission is humility. That's the foundation. And actually, when I talk about this, mo- most of the time, I try to de-emphasize the submission idea because that's been so overloaded with negative connotations uh, 
by the uh, feminist movement today, and we've all been influenced by it in too many ways because that's what we hear day in and day out. It sort of sets certain tones for us in, in terms of certain vocabulary. But the, the, the idea here has to do with humility and, and leadership. And the idea is if you're operating on arrogance, then you cannot be what God intends you to be as a believer in relation to anybody, whether you're a wife, a husband, a parent, a child, an employee, an employer. If you're operating on arrogance, then it's going to be destructive to whatever it is that you are doing. So the fundamental idea in submission to authority is always humility. And so there is to characterize every relationship that a believer has is this idea of humility, not to be forcing our ideas on other people, not to, be, not to make every situation all about us, but to be willing to not make issues out of non-essential things uh, in order to prevent relational uh, breakdown and collapse. Paul then applies that within marriage, and he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then he explains it. He says, for the husband is the head of the wife, is also Christ is the head of the church. So his reasoning for this has to do with a, an, an order of relationship that goes back to Christ. It's not sociological. It doesn't have to do with cultural ideas. He builds it upon the foundation of our relationship to Christ within the church. With husbands, he uses the same model. He goes back to Christ. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Now, we're going to spend more time in these specifics on this, but I, I, I'm just setting the stage for us in terms of an overview uh, this morning. So the, the model for husbands is Christ and the church. Now, guys, I want you to notice something here. Ladies, too, that this is a lot tougher on the men than it is on the women. You know, we, in, the, in a, the post-feminist era, the women always vibrate as soon as you say, wives, submit to your husbands, and they're vibrating so much that they don't really hear how hard this is on the men. And, and the men don't really pay attention to it. That's the other part of the problem. Uh, the standard here is extremely tough on the men. Uh, women say, well, you know, I'm married to this guy. He's not a leader. He's not really that positive the word. He's not that successful. I just got stuck with this bum. And, um, and how, how in the world can God expect me to submit to him? But the husband sitting there saying, I have to love this woman like Christ loved the church? I don't, even, I don't think I could love anyone, even my dog, like Christ loved the church. Jesus Christ gave his life. For the, for the church. And even on our best days and our best moments, it's not that easy for any of us to think that we will give up our life for someone else. That's an extremely high standard. And let me submit to you that that is a tougher standard than the standard for the women. Now, some of you women might not like that, but I think that is a tougher standard. And there's a lot more said here to, uh, to the men about this than what is said to the women. And I think the reason for that is, when we, and we'll see this when we go back into the purpose of marriage, is that God designed the man, the male, to be the head of the home and the leader of the home, and he's the one who is spiritually responsible. He's the initiator within the home. The wife is the, the woman is the responder uh, with, within the home. And in many ways, Though the woman has her own volition and often can rebel and just completely reject truth uh, against the husband, but in many ways it is the husband who through his successful obedience to the word or his failure to obey the word sets the tone, the atmosphere within the home in terms of its spiritual focus. And failure to do that on the part of the, the men is often the cause of marital meltdown. And I would suggest that as we look at Scripture and we look at where uh, 
we are either as Christians in the early 20th century, as a part of American culture in the early 21st century, that the reason that we have the, the problems that we do in terms of uh, uh, gender confusion, uh, gender uh, identity, identity politics, the rise of feminism, radical feminism from the 60s, the reason all of this has happened is because ultimately American males failed. Failed to be, pursue the objective that God defines from the beginning of creation. And as a result of male failure, you have a reaction from the females who go off the cliff in the other direction in reaction to male failure. And then you set up a consequent uh, ping pong effect for every action, there's an equal uh, reaction. And so it goes back and forth, which has led to a further. Uh, distancing of the uh, of, of the two sexes, further collapse. It had, and if we just look back over the last 50 years, since the rise of uh, militant feminism in the early 60s, it has brought us the wonderful fruit of increased uh, marital breakdown, divorce, uh, the rise of gender confusion. Uh, increase in homosexuality and acceptance of homosexuality uh, and many, many other problems associated with uh, the social shift and the social confusion now related to the roles of men and women and, and marriage. And it doesn't get any better. The only solution is going to be a divine uh, solution. So to understand some of these things, we not only have to understand the text of Scripture, but we have to understand uh, what has happened historically. And historically, in Western civilization, there was a massive rejection among the intellectual elite of biblical authority that occurred with what came to be known as the Enlightenment. And the idea was partially good, partially bad, as many things are, throwing off the yoke of authority of the Roman Catholic Church. But there was this confusion where the Roman Catholic Church of the Middle Ages was identified with Christianity. Now, the Roman Catholic Church really wasn't biblically Christian. The Roman Catholic Church had for over a thousand years wedded itself to uh, first Platonic ideas coming out of ancient Greece and then Aristotelian ideas so that the Roman Catholic Church did not represent a biblical view of God, man, and creation. It represented a synthesis between biblical ideas, so there was a lot of biblical nomenclature, but it was just another form of paganism because of its merger with Greek philosophical thought. Now, this brought about a collapse of, in many ways, of Western civilization in its own right until Martin Luther led the charge against the Roman Catholic Church in the Protestant Reformation. And they threw off the authority of the church, but in the Protestant Reformation, they returned to the authority of the Bible so that the uh, so that the battle cry of the Protestant Reformation was sola scriptura, the Bible alone. But there were those who didn't want to go to the authority of the Bible. They wanted to throw out both the Bible and uh, the Roman Catholic Church as an authority. And so they looked to man and mankind as the ultimate source of authority. They were called uh, humanists. And this gave rise to the Enlightenment period, where the shift of authority uh, went away from a god or a creator who revealed himself to man to uh, focusing on human reason or human experience as the ultimate authority. And the reason I say this is what we see again and again in these passages and as we go back to, to Genesis is the issue ultimately is this issue of authority. Who is the ultimate authority in our lives? Is the ultimate authority in our life God or is the ultimate authority in our life culture, experience, human reason, limited reason, uh, whatever? What uh, is it? Over, by the end of the 18th century, this concept of uh, 
uh, the, the, the underlying concept of the Enlightenment, that there was some sort of unifying truth man could discover on his own, uh, was uh, seen to be uh, impossible. And so that idea was thrown out. And starting in the early, early 1800s, uh, you had uh, ideas, at least at the intellectual level, that le- had already shifted to this idea of pure relativism, relativism in knowledge, relativism in truth, relativism in, in every, every area of, of life. And it is that relativistic basis of knowledge that led to the ultimate transformation of Western civilization's views on who human beings are, because after that they became products of just time plus chance, that human beings were no longer uh, created in the image and likeness of God, and therefore every human being has value and meaning and purpose because they're created by God, so that every human being is just the result of some accidental electronic spark on a piece of protoplasm. And so nobody has any real value anymore. So once, once that shift began to take root, that the, the, the view of who, who human beings are changed, then that began to change our understanding of social institutions, such as government, uh, authority itself, uh, responsibility, marriage, family, work, and the role of national entities. A social revolution took place at an intellectual level in the early 1800s and slowly filtered down into the minds and the thinking of everyday citizens by the end of the 19th century. We now live at the end of uh, about 150 years of this sort of revisionist view of men and women, husbands and wives, and the result of this is what we see around us collapse in the integrity of marriage, the politicization of gender, uh, rise and approbation of homosexuality, and in many cases the promotion of homosexuality and all forms of sexual immorality. We're in a crisis. One recent uh, poll or study by the Pew Research Center showed that nearly 40% of Americans believe that marriage is obsolete. Marriages in this country actually have dropped from 2.44 million in 1990 to 2.08 million in 2009. So in a period of almost 20 years, we've uh, dropped about a half a million uh, marriages per year. Uh, that affects statistics on the divorce rate. People don't get as divorced as much as they did back in the 80s. That's because they're not married. It's not because the divorce rate's gone down. It's people just don't get married anymore. So if they don't get married, they don't have to get divorced. Uh, we've seen a, uh, this continued collapse. Um, we've seen the rise in uh, cohabitation of couples. In 1970, 523,000 couples cohabited without benefit of marriage in the United States. By 2010, 40 years later, 7.5 million couples cohabit in the United States. This is a recipe for social collapse because, as we see in the Scripture, is the reason that God uh, ordained marriage is to provide st- not only stability for a culture, but it is, the, it is the framework for education within the culture, for passing on uh, values and knowledge from one generation uh, to the next. At the same time that you've had this, uh, uh, this shift taking place, there has also been a rise of divorce, uh, especially since the 1975 rulings on no-fault divorce, which basically meant that one, uh, one member of the marriage can divorce the other one without showing any cause whatsoever. It takes two to keep a marriage going, but it only takes uh, one to end it. Along with this, we've had a challenge to our basic definitions. What's a marriage? What's a civil union? Uh, How do you define it? Uh, Is it a cultural definition or a definition from an almighty God who created us? Furthermore, there are social costs of divorce, something that has never gone into. But if the divorce rate were cut in half, 
then it would radically change the demands upon the welfare system in the United States. The social cost is, is, um, is unbelievable in terms of dealing with everything from children to the collapse of uh, family fortunes because all the money leaves the family and goes to the lawyer. Then the lawyer's rich, and then he gets a divorce, and it just keeps repeating itself. And, and all of this wealth gets lost, and people end up without, uh, without the means to take care of themselves as they, as they became, become older. This is a radical shift in American culture. Alexis de Tocqueville wrote in the early 19th century as he traveled through the United States and wrote his observations of our culture at that time. He said, there is certainly no country in the world where the tie of marriage is more respected than in America. That certainly is not true today. Now, the feminist movement had a large role in changing our views of marriage, changing our views of maleness, changing our few views of, of uh, femininity. And that started with uh, the attack on traditional marriage by Betty Friedan in uh, 1963, urging wives to leave their homes, join the workforce, and become independent of men. And at the root of this was an idea about the nature of sexual identity or gender, that men and women are, ju- are, are really completely interchangeable. Uh, you may focus on a few physical characteristics that are different. And who was it that said, viva la difference? But in the feminist view, they're just completely interchangeable. Men can do everything thing women can do. Women should be able to do everything that men can do. What ha- the result of that idea is that in many cases, and I'm not blaming parents for this, but in many cases what has happened is parents raise their children, especially their daughters, uh, to be men, to do everything men can do. And then they wonder why when they grow up they have gender confusion. And that happens. And it's, it's because we, th- we were infected by these ideas that, that there's not really a distinction between men and women. And they should be equal. Now, there were some good things that came out of, uh, of that movement. There, th- th- but this was just the bait. The bait was that women should get equal pay for equal work. That's true. That should be the case. If anyone does X amount of work, then they should get the same pay, the same reward. There should be certain equalities. But that doesn't mean that as as individuals, as women and as men, that they are identical. God created them differently. But if you don't buy into a creation, a biblical creation view of the human race, then this is the logical consequence. It all just happens by uh, time and chance, and it just came along, and 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 <clears throat> that's all there is to it. The first, as you look back over the uh, feminist movement, uh, the feminist movement sought to redefine the the roles of, of women. And in order to do that and to be successful, they uh, sought, first of all, to destroy the institution and the inviolability of, of marriage. And they attacked it by getting uh, the laws for divorce uh, liberalized so that it would be easy to terminate a, a divorce. Uh, at the same time, coming out of the 60s, you also had uh, the, the war on poverty that came out of the LBJ, uh, the LBJ administration, which established the, much of the current welfare system, which channeled all welfare distribution through the mothers. At the same time, with the rise of the feminist movement, you have uh, legal decisions made in terms of uh, welfare that rendered the husband and the father irrelevant to the family's economic well-being. So you've demasculinized the men. You've removed them politically through legislation from a position of uh, influence and significance in the family. Uh, There were many other factors that were going on, and I'll pick up some some of those, but I want to go look at the essential issue here that underlies all of this, and that is that, that there is a failure to understand 
that there is a divinely established difference between men and women. It is not just physical. It is also has to do with the, the, the entire makeup of the individual soul and spirit, and that God established distinct spheres of responsibility from men and women. And that is not to say, because it's often mischaracterized, that's the other thing we have to fight with this, is that, that there are so many mischaracterizations, and in some cases they're, they're legitimate because as men went off the deep end in one direction, they abused women. And one of the things that we saw, and if you haven't listened to my series on Judges, go back and listen to it, is that in a culture that is in decline, there will be a related uh, breakdown in marriage and the family, and men will become feminized and women will become masculinized. And as that happens, the increase of abuse from men to women uh, will take place. This is a result of a breakdown of role distinction. And it's because the further we get away from the absolutes laid down by God's word, the more everything uh, goes into, into meltdown. So in order to address the, uh, our purpose of marriage, we just have to very simply go back to the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, we have a summary of God's creation of the human race. You might want to turn with me there because we'll not only look at this passage, but we'll look at another passage in Genesis chapter 2. Now, these two passages help us to understand God's purpose for creating the human race, male and female, and the value of every member of the human race. In Genesis chapter 1, we have the overview of God's creative activity in terms of the six active days of creation and the one day of rest. On the sixth day of creation, as the crowning element of his creation, God created the human race. God said, let us make man in our image. The plural here indicates the act, full activity and full involvement of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image. And the word translated man there is not the word for male, but the word for mankind or the human race. Let us make the human race, mankind, in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And then we see a repetition of this, first the command, and then in verse 27, we see it's in, act, in, in action, and then it, is, um, it repeats the same idea, so we get the point. In verse 27, we read, So God created man in his own image, and that would be mankind, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. So what the text is saying here is that both men and women are equally created in the image of God. This is what sets human beings apart from all other living creatures, is that they are in the image and the likeness of God. They reflect God as a being. They are a finite representation of God. They have mentality where they can think God's thoughts after him. They have volition where they can choose to follow God. And they have a conscience. They have the understanding of right and wrong so that they can understand and perceive righteousness and the path of righteousness. There's a lot more that goes into that. But the point that I'm simply making is that as created... There's no distinction in terms of their essence or being or makeup between men and women. They are both equally in the image of God. But there's a distinction in role. Now, the distinction in role doesn't mean that one is inherently superior to the other because we just established that that's not true. They are equally in the image of God. There's not that one is superior to the other in makeup whatsoever. But there's a role distinction. Just like on a football team, there are role distinctions. You have certain characteristics and qualities that are necessary to have a quarterback. You look for other characteristics and qualities that are necessary to have 
a, a, a good uh, defensive tackle. Uh, they are both necessary for the team to fulfill its objective, but they have different roles to play, and they're not interchangeable. That doesn't mean one is a better athlete than the other. They just have different roles and capabilities, but both are equally important uh, to the overall um, the overall operation of the team. So we come to chapter 2, and in chapter 2, beginning in verse 7, God gives us a more detailed understanding of what took place on that sixth day. There we learn that God created the male before he created the female. And we read in uh, verse uh, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now this is the male. We then learn that he had a role for the male. He placed him in the garden. And he gave him certain responsibilities. The first responsibilities was to uh, name, identify, uh, classify all of the animals. He was, uh, he was told that he could eat from anything. They got it provided everything for him. He could eat from everything in the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But he's given the task of taking care of the garden, and that began with naming and classifying the animals. As he does that, he realizes that the animals are all paired off. But he's not. He's alone. So God's teaching him something in the process. He realizes that there is nothing comparable to him. All the other creatures have a, have a mate. He does not. So in verse 21, God caused his deep sleep to fall upon him, and he took out one of his ribs, closed up the flesh, and from the rib God fashioned the female. This shows that they are, there is a fundamental unity between, in the human race that you did, don't have some sort of um, uh, a polygenesis where men came out of one stream of evolution, women came out of another stream of evolution, but God creates the man first, then the woman. That's significant because God is establishing the male as the authority. Now, we're going to have to talk about authority a little more next time, but their authority exists in the Godhead. Authority is not a bad thing. Authority is inherent even within the makeup of God. God the Father is the Father. He is the leader and the ultimate authority within the Godhead. Jesus said, I can do nothing unless the Father gives it to me. Authority isn't something that is bad. Authority can become perverted because of sin, but authority existed for eternity in the Godhead, and it existed in the Garden of Eden before sin ever caused any kind of disruption between Adam and Eve. So God creates the woman from his side, indicating that there is a unity there. Both are equal in terms of their possessing the image of God and reflecting uh, the nature of God, but there, are, there is a distinct uh, role. And the distinction there is seen from verse 18. In verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. And that word there for helper means someone who assists him in uh, uh, achieving a goal or an objective. Now, the objective is stated back in Genesis 1, 26, that man was to have dominion over all of creation. He was to rule over all of creation as God's representative. And he had to, but yet he just given all of the raw natural resources out there on the earth, and he has to exercise dominion. This is going to take a lengthy period of time, thousands of years. He cannot do it alone. He needs a helper, an assistant. Now, there are those who are influenced by feminism who say, well, a helper, that is a, that, that is a secondary role. That's a secondary task. He minimizes, you see, the Bible minimizes women from the very beginning. But that is only because people have rejected the authority of Scripture from the get-go. The Really, the only person who is consistently called a helper in the Scripture is God. 
That word is applied to God numerous places. We see that word Atzer in the Hebrew as part of the name of, uh, of Aaron's son, Eli Atzer, God is my helper. And in Psalm 121, 1, 2, and verse 8, we see the word repeated uh, several times. The psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? Same word, Atzer. My help, my Atzer, comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The Lord is our helper. The, the, the concept of being a helper is an extremely high task. That word is applied only to God. So this is not a term that is demeaning of wi- the role of women, but exalts the role of women from the very beginning of creation. And so we see that the biblical view that when we begin to talk about these issues of authority and gender and role distinctives, that they were embedded within creation before sin ever came along. And they are there for a purpose so that the human race, as those created in the image of God, can fulfill that destiny. That's the purpose. The purpose is not happiness. That's a byproduct. The purpose is not uh, economic advancement. Uh, The purpose is not procreation. The purpose is to fulfill the mission of God to exercise dominion over all that God has created as the representative of God. When that is done the way God says it should be done, a byproduct of that will be stability and it will be joy and and there will be happiness. If there is no joy and no happiness and no fulfillment, then it is because the individuals involved have lost sight of the goal or the objective. They're not trying to do, uh, achieve God's objective God's way. They're trying to do it their own way. And once that happens, then it start, everything starts to break down, fragment, and collapse. But we have to go back to the beginning, build the case, because so many of us, whether we realize it or not, have been, had our ideas affected to one, a small degree or a large degree by the ideas on gender and role distinctions prevalent in our culture today. So next time we're going to come back and go further into this whole issue of gender, because as Betty Friedan mentioned in a speech on, uh, related to Uh, the observance of Women's Liberation Day in New York City in 1970, she predicted presciently that the battle would be over God. Is God a he? And little would we have expected from 1970 that 40 years later we would have multiple Bibles that uh, now are gender neutral and even refer to some that refer to God as as a she. So what has happened? How are we to understand this? It is permeating everything. So we'll come back and begin there next time. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to reflect upon who you are and your creation, to be reminded that we were created to glorify you, to exercise dominion over creation, and yet after Genesis 3, sin entered into human experience and human history and sin caused a complete, complete collapse and breakdown in how we understand our role and our responsibilities as individuals before you. Sin is the cause of the breakdown that occurs in families and in marriage. And it is only on the basis of realizing, first of all, redemption in Jesus Christ, and then renovating our thinking that we can overcome the uh, consequences of sin in our marriages, and in our families. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning that's unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that both sure and certain. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. And he has done that in full. It is complete. You need to add nothing to it. The only thing required is to believe that Jesus died for you. The instant that you trust in him, you have eternal life. Father, we pray that you would challenge us, encourage us, strengthen us, and strengthen our homes and strengthen our marriages and families as we study these things. In Christ's name, amen.